Hey, uh, I'm Adi Osmani. Uh, I work on a few different bits and pieces in Chrome. I work on uh, things like loading, uh, performance, uh, PWAs. Uh, I work over in Mountain View. Um, probably the, the best part of our office is that we have an offline dinosaur in the corner. Um, unfortunately, when, uh, when the folks that were making this, constructing it, they decided to add an extra set of legs um, to the dinosaur. Uh, and as per last year, the Chrome team wanted me to let you know that the back legs have been deprecated. We just haven't removed them just yet, but we're working on it. It'll happen eventually. Um, last year was a big year for progressive web apps for us. Uh, there's a lot of focus around these apps that are sort of fast, engaging, and offer a, um, a deeper, more meaningful experience on mobile devices. Um, and we saw a lot of good traction with PWAs, um, I think especially in emerging markets. Um, 2017 has been a big year where progressive web apps um, are starting to go a lot more mainstream. Uh, we recently uh, completed this, uh, this, this collaboration with Twitter, uh, getting out Twitter Lite, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Um, Forbes also rolled out their uh, new PWA for their mobile experience. And in other markets, we've seen um, large companies like Ola uh, go all in on mobile web um, for their experiences, um, and they've been seeing good numbers off the back of that too. Now on the um, sort of JavaScript and API side, um, there are a few different changes we've been making to try making PWAs sort of um, a better first-class citizen um, on platforms like Android. Uh, so this year we introduced the ability for PWAs to be more deeply integrated. Uh, so a PWA that um, is sort of passing all the, the check marks in, in Lighthouse uh, will be able to get um, a presence in the application drawer next to the rest of your native apps. Um, it'll be manageable like a native app is. Um, you'll be able to, you know, go into the place where you normally, uh, you know, control all of your native apps. You'll be able to see how much storage uh, PWA is taking up. You'll be able to control, like, permissions and notifications um, and so on. And anytime you're looking for an app, um, the same places you look for a native app um, in Android, you'll also be able to find them there. Um, outside of that, now that's kind of huge because that's, that's a platform with, like, over a billion users investing in trying to make um, web apps a first-class citizen there. But we've also been working on trying to improve... Um, our lower level capabilities too. Uh, so we've been investing in trying to um, level up push notifications. Uh, most recently, uh, we, uh, we started shipping uh, Navigator Media Session, uh, which gives you sort of media-based notifications. Uh, we also experimented with the WebShare API, which allows you to sort of call out to uh, the share sheet, um, that's the sort of native uh, Android share sheet, uh, for sharing um, URLs with other applications. Uh, we're just about wrapping up an origin trial on that. Um, and we also ship support for display full screen, which gives you the ability to hide that bar at the very top of the screen that usually um, has sort of network information and battery information. So you have complete control over all of the real estate um, that's on your phone. Uh, Twitter, one of the um, more, most recent um, folks that experimented with web share. Um, and the way that you use this is using the navigator.share API. You pass it an object containing sort of a title, text, and a URL. Um, in Twitter's case, they decided to sort of customize the UI, and when you'd end up sort of just calling share on it, it would go and it would show um, up that, um, that share sheet on Android. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the origin trial is, is just about wrapping up, and we're hopefully going to take on any feedback that we got during that to, to make sure that the API is exactly what folks um, want it to be. Um, outside of that, we've also been trying to improve the ability for folks to ship um, really complex media experiences on the web. Um, in Chrome 57, we introduced the Shape Detection API. Now, this is great for allowing you, without having to sort of just handle this in client-side JavaScript entirely on your own using something like CCV, um, to detect shapes. So barcodes, detect faces, detect uh, text um, in things like articles. Um, and this is an API that's relatively convenient to use. It allows you to take advantage um, of the hardware acceleration that um, an actual device has instead of just trying to do a lot of this stuff on your own. Um, avoids you also having to ship down a library to do this. And uh, Paul Kinlan has got a great article that talks about some of our capabilities there that I'd recommend folks go and check out. Uh, we've also introduced um, an intent to ship for the image capture API. Um, for anyone that's tried, you know, building Instagram-like capabilities on the web before, you've probably noticed that we've been lacking the ability to really take control of the camera and do things like control zoom and focus, resolution, um, get control over sort of ISO or the flash. And um, the media image capture API uh, solves a lot of those use cases. 
Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing uh, that ship and, and um, whether there are any remaining gaps um, that we can we can fill in for people that are trying to build those types of rich camera experiences on the web too. Uh, the payment request API is something that we shipped in Chrome 53, and the idea here um, is that it gives you this native UI that makes checkout flow a lot easier. Um, so you can select, you can add payments um, in a fast and consistent way using a sort of standardized imperative um, API. Um, and we're starting to see people uh, pick this up too. Um, just yesterday, we heard that Kogan.com, uh, one of Australia's uh, largest department stores, um, ship support for uh, payment request as well. And we're hoping to see you know, an increased number of people trying this out and giving us feedback on uh, how we can improve the overall UX flow um, and see if users actually enjoy this experience uh, more than custom uh, sort of checkout flows that they, do, they have at the moment. Uh, I'm going to talk about performance um, real quick. Uh, I care a lot about performance. I'm going to focus very quickly on V8. So uh, on the V8 side in the past, uh, we've used different sets of benchmarks for optimizing. Uh, Octane is probably one of the ones that we're better known for optimizing against. Uh, and that was a benchmark that sort of stressed peak performance. But over the last year or two, um, we've noticed that the optimizations we would get out of, out of Octane didn't always um, represent uh, optimizations that would help real-world web apps. So if you're someone that's building apps using like React or Ember or Angular or any of those things, um, Octane performance wins didn't always result in uh, the same type of wins we'd hope to see with those types of applications. Um, but we noticed that other benchmarks uh, like Speedometer did. Uh, and so we've been putting in a lot of work trying to um, optimize for real-world uh, workloads across uh, actual pages that people are using. So things like, you know, uh, sites that are in the top 25 on the web, like Facebook and Wikipedia and so on. Um, this is a breakdown of sort of where time is spent in JavaScript. Uh, so Octane at the very top um, spent quite a lot of time in just uh, JavaScript itself. Uh, Speedometer uh, is a benchmark that sort of uh, stress tests framework code. Um, and what we noticed there was that a lot more time is spent in things like runtime um, and parsing. And real-world uh, workloads actually uh, happen to spend a lot more time in parsing and compilation than we thought. Uh, so we're working on trying to make things like parsing um, a lot faster so that pages can start up quicker than they do today. Um, some quick wins uh, that we've seen there over the last 6 to 12 months. Uh, so uh, we've seen a 30% um, increase in our performance on real-world sites, 14% uh, wins on framework application performance. So between 14 and 30 are roughly the numbers there. Uh, we saw a 7% reduction in the time um, blocking the main thread with JavaScript execution, thanks to our new uh, compiler pipeline, uh, which is powered by Ignition and TurboFan. We've got a few blog posts on that. Uh, we're edging closer to parity on um, our ES2015 performance compared to ES5. Uh, we're, we're still a few percentage off in a few places, but um, for a lot of different classes of applications, this should, this should actually be fine. Uh, if you're someone using Babel, I actually highly recommend checking out uh, Babel's preset env so that you're only transpiling yes. code uh, that your browser doesn't support. Um, we're also uh, heavily working on, in progress on our modules implementation and our dynamic import implementation, and we hope to see a little bit more um, to share there around Chrome 59 or Chrome 60. Now, uh, we know that the mobile web can be slow for a number of reasons. Uh, people tend to ship down a lot more JavaScript than they need. Uh, they tend to ship down you know, uh, images that are too large, um, you know, paint storms. Uh, a lot of things can end up causing um, experiences on, on mobile devices to, um, to be subpar. Uh, we've got you know, constraints on CPU and battery and memory and so on. Um, but we, that hasn't sort of stopped uh, folks like Twitter actually shipping relatively fast experiences that are really, really great um, on mobile devices, like average mobile devices as well, not just the high-end stuff. Uh, so Twitter Lite um, took advantage of the purple pattern that Polymer discovered last year. So they're taking advantage of Service Worker for pre-caching their static assets as well as their application shell. Um, they're taking advantage of preload for sort of increasing the priority of critical path JavaScript that they need to be uh, loading early on. Um, breaking up their scripts, uh, they're interactive in about five seconds on 3G, which is great. Um, they're using the platform correctly, so they're deferring expensive rendering using requests on a callback. Uh, they're using the platform for data savings, uh, so they've got a great data saver mode in there where uh, if you turn it on, um, it won't actually load the full image or the full uh, animated GIFs or videos when you scroll through your timeline. Um, it's completely up to you as a user you know, to say, well, hey, I, I do actually want to look at that animated GIF of a cat and then pop it up. Um, 
But Twitter didn't really get to that place without a little bit of work. Um, now, on our side, the way that we ask people to check in on uh, how well they're doing is using a tool called Lighthouse. And um, Twitter's initial app that they, they tried filling this PWA with uh, wasn't particularly fast. Uh, they had a time to interactive of about 15 seconds, which is based on our research about how long it takes for a lot of apps that are built using you know, modern frameworks to get interactive on average hardware. And Twitter, Twitter did a number of different things to, to sort of speed this up. Um, one of the first things they did was breaking up their monolithic JavaScript bundles, like these really large bundles of code that weren't all needed when a user sort of opened, you know, landed on Twitter and started scrolling through their timeline. They broke that work up into what I believe ended up being sort of 30 or 40 different um, chunks uh, across the entire experience. And this meant that they went from, um, you know, a, a very lengthy time to interactive score down to something that's a lot more manageable. Um, this is their Lighthouse scores right after, where they were interactive at this point in time um, in under six seconds. They, they were eventually able to bring it down to, to something even lower than that. Now, I just wanted to show you some really quick demos um, of new stuff that we've landed in DevTools to help with the developer side of like trimming down um, your bundles. So, quick demos, um, if my system can manage uh, QuickTime and Chrome and Canary and all these different things being open. So let's pop open that, and let's use mobile Twitter um, for this demo. So the first thing I'm going to show you um, is our code coverage feature, which we recently shipped um, in Canary. Uh, if, uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, we also added uh, like a new little What's New tab um, in Chrome 59. Uh, I believe it was Chrome 58, Chrome 59 um, that shows you what's new. But with code coverage, the basic idea is that um, I can, say, start recording this page, um, and it'll go and it'll check what JavaScript would actually, was actually being executed um, during this page load. And then it'll process um, those different code paths. And it'll show me um, directly inside of code coverage um, how much JavaScript I was and wasn't using. So here we can see we've got unused bytes uh, being displayed. We've also got the total number of bytes. And these are all the different JavaScript bundles that Twitter have for their experience. And what we can see here is that it says that, you know, maybe only about half of the bundle um, that they were fetching uh, was being used. Now that's great, but it doesn't give you um, sort of a completely nuanced picture. Maybe some of that code is being used across different views. So coverage also supports this other idea of um, point in time uh, recording. So I can start recording here. I can go and I can reload this page, um, let it go and execute the different um, paths that it has to. And then I can navigate um, across different views. And uh, I'm not gonna turn on notifications just yet, but um, I can go and I can stop that. And I can see that um, more and more of that um, actual bundle was being used, which is great because it gives me a slightly more complete picture of the story. Um, code coverage also lets you see sort of uh, CSS stats, um, depending on the type of application you're using. Um, and this can be helpful for you understanding how many opportunities you have to further code split. So go check out code coverage. Um, something that we just shipped um, as well, so let's head over to the network panel, and for this, I'm going to very quickly dive over to theverge.com. So, as we can see, theverge.com is still loading up, and this is on Wi-Fi. This is like um, corporate Wi-Fi. It's really, really fast. Um, it's still, you know, it's taking, what, 12, 13 seconds to load up. Um, if I had uh, 3G network throttling enabled here, this would take a lot longer. So what we can do here um, now in the latest Canary is let's go and let's ignore product. Let's go to time and see what took the most time um, to actually load on this page. So we can see that there are some um, what appear to be beacon scripts, um, maybe from ads. We can see that there are some animated GIFs that took a while to load up, different um, third-party scripts. And what we've introduced is the ability uh, for you to, sorry about that, we've introduced this ability for you to select a request and actually block the request URL or block the request domain. So let's do that for some of these requests. Now, um, every single time that you do this, we're going to add it to this new panel down at the very bottom called request blocking. Um, and what this panel allows you to do is basically investigate exactly what impact dropping a particular resource on your page is going to have on your critical path performance. So if I go and say, well, I know that I'm going to be running ads on my page, but I'm not entirely sure what vendors are sort of, you know, the, the worst actors in slowing down my performance, um, this feature can be really useful for understanding that. Um, it's also useful for sort of just um, deciding, well, hey, do I really need that image header that I'm, you know, uh, dropping in at the very top of my page or other stuff that's lower down um, that the user may not find particularly useful. 
so in this case, um, they said that there's a one meg sized um, thing here. Let's go and say we've blocked that. I'm just going to reload the page really quickly. And what we should notice um, as we go through here, let's see, is that the page actually loaded just a little bit faster than it did before. Um, so go check out request blocking. Um, I'm really excited about this feature. I've been waiting a long time for it to land, and hopefully you'll find that useful. Um, very last thing uh, for me is uh, we also, so let's go to a quick progressive web app. Uh, I'm going to go to housing.com. And uh, what I'm going to do here is let's actually try to load up the mobile experience. Um, if you go to experiments, so DevTools, experiments, and you hit that shift thing to get the secret experiments, and you uh, checkbox audits 2.0, uh, one thing that you'll notice is that we've introduced, uh, this is an early preview. Uh, um, audits 2.0 is basically Lighthouse and DevTools. And the idea is that you can just go and run an audit, um, and it will go and, and basically do every single progressive web app and uh, web platform best practice test that Lighthouse has. Um, it'll go and run these a couple of times to collect all the different data around you know, uh, APIs you could be using to, to make this experience even faster. Um, and what you'll see is that we get a Lighthouse report directly inside of DevTools. Um, there's a lot of work being done to improve the overall experience of this, and this is, again, uh, an early preview, but um, hopefully this is something folks will find useful. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the things that I work on uh, is loading, um, and we've been talking a lot about that uh, over on the reloading blog, so medium.com slash reloading. Uh, if you're interested in checking some of that stuff out, please do. But um, that's otherwise it for me. Uh, we've got quite a few uh, intents to ship out at the moment for everything from animated PNG support to long tasks and writable streams. Um, but you can find out more um, at Google I.O. in a few weeks or uh, developers.google.com slash web. So thank you. Hey there. Are you into reactive programming using JavaScript? Do you have to deal with asynchrony in your web app? And join this dot instructor Ben Lesh to learn all of the ins and outs of RxJS in his hands-on workshop. Available online and in person, go to rxworkshop.com for more details and to book your spot today. Hey there, do you use Angular? Do you like fun in the sun? And how do you feel about boats? If you're nodding yes, then uh, come join us on NG Cruise to learn more about Angular while on a fabulous Caribbean cruise. Check out ngcruise.com for speaker lineup, workshop details, and to book your spot today.